The Game of Zen explores the often overlooked ways in which professional, personal, and spiritual growth are interrelated. We dive deep into the life teachings of the Buddha and the mindfulness practices of Zen, revealing how they can help us dramatically expand our possibilities for wholehearted work, life, and play. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Game of Zen podcast. This is Scott Berman checking in from Philadelphia, PA, and I'm joined as usual by my good friend and mentor, Sensei Paul from Boulder, Colorado. How's it going, Paul? It's going really well. I'm having a good day. Feeling good here in Boulder. How about you? I'm doing well, too. Uh, definitely enjoying the, the weather's getting better here in Philly. We're getting to we got daylight savings coming up. So... That's always good. And uh, we're heading towards spring. Yeah, right on. And some warmer weather. <laughs> so, Paul, I'm excited about today's episode. Um, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about psychedelics. Um, they're involved in a lot of stories these days. There's a lot of material out there. And we want to share some of our experiences and some of the history of what's going on in the in, in this space. And um you know, what are your thoughts about kicking this off today? Yeah, I'm really excited for this too. This is going to be a little bit of a different episode we've talked about. We're going to share a lot of our own personal experience and what brings us to um, using psychedelics now in, in certain ways in our lives and, and with our people. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's maybe a little bit controversial, but less and less so. We've got a really amazing psychedelic renaissance going on. And I'm excited to just get personal and share with our listeners, you know, how we're uh, how we're finding it. Yeah, yeah, me too. And I think there's, you know, we're going to talk about it a little later, but there are clear connections um, that we see in our own lives between mindfulness, Buddhism, meditation and the psychedelics situation. And, you know, we'll get to that. Um, but I thought maybe we would start off with uh, a bit of a history of, you know, what we how we got into all this. Right. So um, I'll start and give it a shot. Um, my journey with psychedelics and, and I just want to add one thing really quickly is that this isn't for everybody. And uh, it took me a long time to really get comfortable with it. Um, when I was in college and as a younger person, I was afraid of it and I didn't want to do it. People around me were doing things and I said, nah, I don't think, you know, and, and I'm really glad now that I didn't do it in that in that time period. I think you need to be you know, feel good about yourself. You need to be an adult, of course, but um, you need to be in a good frame of mind um, before you embark on this journey. Um, so for me, it happened very slowly. And uh, I actually remember I was at a music festival in when I was in my 40s and my best friend and, and I had a couple of really close friends, which is important. Uh, they said, hey, do you want to try some LSD? And I said, OK, let's give it a shot. Um, and I had a great time. <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun. I felt really good about it. I felt like it lasted, uh, you know, a long time that day. But it just there was so, so, something about it that stuck with me. It was an overwhelmingly positive experience. And at the end of the weekend, I said to my friend, uh, can I take some of that home with me? And that that began my journey of, of starting with it. And um, I would say that was about 15 years ago, maybe. Um, and slowly but surely, it's become an, a more important part of my life. And I feel like it's very positive. Um, got a lot more to say about that. But Paul, I'd love to hear how your journey went. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share my journey. And it's a pretty, you know, extensive one going back to my 20s. But first, I want to say, you know, th this is just the beginning of the conversation. If you're coming in and just learning from scratch about these things, this psychedelic renaissance, so-called, that we are in the early stages of, and I do believe it to be that way. Um, there's so much amazing stuff being done now. So go and look at, listen to the podcasts with uh, James Fadiman, who's doing, you know, has long been a great researcher into, into various um, usages, you know, of, of these things. Um, the Huberman podcast has some has some great material on uh, psychoactives. A number of, of different episodes. So this is this is just the beginning. Scott and I are giving you our experience. Um, as he said, um, 
th this isn't for everyone, um, but there are very clear protocols and usages that have come down anecdotally over the decades since psychoactives have been introduced into the West um, and more and more uh, with real strong research base. So, so hopefully this is just a contribution to your, our listeners, um, you know, journey into, into this medicine and how it might be used. Don't, don't take us as gospel and anything, just a, um, we're sharing our experience and uh, it may, may be an encouragement to you to do more. So with that said, um, I, I got into psychedelics in my 20s. Um, I was really curious. And I would say my curiosity was, th was in, at the same root as my, my curiosity around meditation and Buddhism, because I was getting into those things at the same time. And what I was learning about Buddhism, about an expanded state of consciousness, a different way of seeing myself, not as a limited being, but as something else. Um, these accounts of these, you know, experiences that people were having on psychedelics were of a kind for me with the experiences that people were having on meditation, you know, doing deep meditation. So I was drawn to experiment with psychedelics. Um, LSD and psilocybin were the main ones back then for my 20s. I did not have good set and setting control in those days. Um, so I, I had a number of, I would say, I would say they were not uniformly good trips by any means. Um, I had stuff coming up that was I didn't know how to deal with. I was often, I, I felt unsafe sometimes, you know, do, do a large dose and then take a train to downtown Chicago and wander the streets. Um, so they weren't they weren't really always protected settings um but i but i learned a lot actually so I, a, a lot of doors were opened for me which i really took into my meditation practice it really just incented me more to do a meditation practice because i never wanted to be beholden to a substance i wanted to expand my mind you know natively if, if you will and so uh, it was it was a it was a fuel and an encouragement for me to enter into that meditation practice, which was my main path for decades, right? And then there were a period of about 20 years where I didn't do any um, any psychedelics. And then I got into my um, mid 40s, mid to late 40s, and um, I was I had, had the opportunity to do ayahuasca and to jump into some of these more you know really high powered psychoactives. Um, that had started to kind of enter into our culture, you know, back then about 15 years ago. And so I did a number of ayahuasca experiences as well as a DMT experience, yahe. And I, um, I found those to be in somewhat interesting, um, entered expanded states of consciousness. There wasn't too much that was completely unfamiliar to me after decades of meditation experience. Um, but there were, there was some, some territory, I would say some emotional territory that maybe I hadn't, I hadn't addressed in my, in my meditation practice. Um, but I, I had, I got to a place where it was no longer, um, you know, quite relevant for me personally. Um, I got connected with my now wife and she was in a place where she was doing some deep dive therapy work. And she was uh, connected with some people who were exploring ayahuasca. So I did a, a journey with her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ayahuasca journeys, you typically the men and female are separated. So it, it, I, we were separated in the big room. There were probably 50 people all together, you know, journeying mm -hmm. overnight. And so it was together in that way. But um, I that was one of the experiences where I was happy to have done it, but it didn't really add too much. More to me, I will. I will say this: um, what I what I did enjoy the most, and this applied to my DMT experience as well. It was actually coming back down from mm. the peak of the psychedelic experience and reintegrating that um, expanded consciousness, you know, even unity consciousness, with the relative existence of myself and my personality and my body, you know, function. Yeah in in the midst of other people so that bridge area of kind of both and was was the, by far the more interesting and richer territory for me than the peak of the experience with its expansion and its you know loss of self and mm -hmm. and all of that. 
stuff. Um, my wife got something out of her experience, but not enough to really incent her to do it any further. So that was that was a period there. Now we come up to the last few years and um, knowing my own experience of the doors that were opened for me from psychedelic experience, I, um, I, I see it as a tool for those who want to have some doors and windows opened if they're on a path of awakening and to um, definitely to heal um, some of the wounds that they might have. This, this kind of puts us into the therapeutic context. Um, and there's a lot of research being done. We'll talk about that in, in a second. But I, I just, um, I know uh, the, the promise of, of the psychoactives to kind of help with that area. And um, I've also been, my, just speaking personally, I've been microdosing for about two years um, with low levels of psilocybin. And I find it to be a very effective, um, I, I call it like clearing out the cobwebs of my mind. My yeah. meditation practice does that. And this gives a little extra juice to the mm -hmm. to what my meditation practice is doing as well um, with microdosing. So we'll, we'll say more about that, but that's, that's been my personal journey. That's awesome. Thank you. And you, you brought up a couple really interesting topics. One is opening doors and windows. And I think about that every time that I do something that certain doors are open. And if I'm by myself and, and I'm in the woods, you know, then I'm, I'm, you know, a door's open and then there's a deer over there and I'm like looking at the deer or whatever. But then if I'm at a, a concert and I have my best friends with me and we're, we're, we're enjoying our time together and I'm watching the guitar player, you know, that's another door that's opened, you know, the musical door. And so the, it does do that very effectively. And I wanted to uh, bring up also, I want to go backwards a little bit and talk about how we got here as, as a society, because the things that you, you just described are extremely positive and they're very therapeutic. However, our government in its wisdom outlawed this stuff for a long time. And so we're at a really good point in history because we're finally, it's reemerging. This isn't new. Let's just want to, you know, be clear. Everyone should do, do research on this. You know, we can't say this enough. It's, you know, be careful and do your research and learn. But this has been going on for 50, 60 years. You know, back in the uh, 50s, the government was testing LSD on soldiers in, in, uh, in the, the CIA. They wanted to think they figured it was a truth serum to get prisoners to talk. There's a really funny video called MK Ultra of, of uh, army guys that are whacked out on acid walking around the army base. It's pretty funny. But anyway, um, we, they were also in Harvard and uh, other institutions. They were they were getting a lot of value out of testing psychedelics on people that had mental health issues. And it was extremely positive. Things were really moving along quickly. A guy by the name of Timothy Leary and Ram Das, they decided to take some acid out to California and give it to the deadheads and things changed. You know, it became a much more of a recreational situation. The government, look, it's understandable. They didn't know what to do at the time and it was scary. So they just said outlawed all of it and they outlawed all of the testing. That was the biggest crime of those days is that they wanted to just get it off the streets and so they didn't allow any of the doctors to study it anymore and got people that got fired and left their jobs. So it went we went into this long period of not knowing and it was always still around underground. But there was this fear factor involved. And I grew up with that fear factor. That's one of the reasons why I didn't do it when I was younger, because I thought I would flip out and, and I, you know, I didn't want to do that. So I think that now we're in, we fast forward to today that we're opening up research we have a lot more people that have experience and a lot more positive stuff. And it's some fascinating things are coming out of it. Um, we know a lot of the things you just said about, un, you know, opening windows and creating new pathways of thought. That's extremely beneficial for people that are either having severe mental illness or the betterment of well people, which is a, a term that Michael Pollan and I highly recommend the book, How to Change Your Mind. I think there's also a Netflix show about it. And basically he just goes through and talks about the, what it does for you and why it's important. But, and that it could help if someone's suffering from major PTSD, anxiety, suicidal thoughts or whatever, it could be a game changer, even addiction, you know, alcoholism. 
but it's also good for people who are in good shape to begin with and they just want to get better and they want to improve. I know, Paul, you've talked about therapeutic uh, spiritual seekers and performance mm -hmm. as three areas um, that we like to work on with psychedelics. So can you expand a little bit more on how it fits into those three? Yeah, so there, there's kind of three subcultures, you could say, that are a part of this second wave psychedelic renaissance. Um, there's the the therapeutic community, which, as you just sketched out, is doing you know so much work with uh, psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine, and LSD, primarily around treatment of of distinct clinical conditions, you know, depression, OCD, PTSD, um, and with remarkable results, right? Remarkable results with large doses, and then also micro doses on on some of these things. So there's that whole world. Um, there's the world of, you know, spiritual seekers, those looking for consciousness enhancement, um, mind enhancement um, that has been around, you know, since the 60s. Um, the therapeutic community was active in the 60s as well until that got closed down by government, you know, diktat, if you will. But the spiritual seekers have been around all, all, all along. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and have been, you know, using psychedelics all along ever since the the '60s, um, and those and and though those people are still, you know, still here and even growing, and the medicines are being used in that context, consciously uh, as a as a waking up, right? And then the, the third one is we could we could say it's this um, performance enhancement or. Um, bringing your your best self and your fullest self, your your most well and whole self and mind um, to your work in the world, to how you're functioning in your work and your relationships. So these three areas, you know, they're, they're kind of well known. The first one is growing up and cleaning up. That's the kind of psychological therapeutic, you know, area. There's the uh, waking up is the spiritual sector. And there's the stepping up which is step up to our relationships and our work in the world and who we are as individuals and people. And these are all three, you know, beautiful paths that all everyone, that all individuals, you know, are engaged in. And these medicines have proven to be allies in all three of these paths. Yeah. And it's and performance is interesting too, because uh, there are a lot of articles about um, high powered executives you know, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, uh, these guys are regularly, you know, we're regularly doing psychedelics. In fact, there's a lot of concern about Elon right now because some people think it's a negative thing. He's the head of a corporation. He's doing ketamine, you know, and, and many people think, hey, that's great. He's a genius, you know, like he should be doing that. That's maybe he comes up with how to reach Mars while he's, you know, or something. But I think the point is that in, in a lot of different companies, it's being considered and it's being used in different ways to actually for individual and for team performance. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm part of a bunch of different um, things. I go to conferences sometimes and I notice that uh, some more and more people are, are on psilocybin and there's more and more connections made and people are like enjoying it. And it's sort of, you know, but we're all working at the same time, you know, like, so it's, it's a way to make even more connections when you're networking in a group it can be used for that purpose too. You, you know, I know you recently did this in a trade show that you went to, and and Scott, it's it's really interesting to me because when you told me, you came back and it was almost a controlled experiment, right? You 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 asked people <laughs> if they wanted to do it, many of them did, and then you talked with all of them after this. I I, I think it would yeah. be great for you to share that with our listeners. You know how that all went down. It was it was a very positive experience and I'm not going to say any details to protect the, the individuals, but we basically had a you know, we had a, a party and we were we were networking with a bunch of VIPs and we, we invited a bunch of people. And, you know, it was there was a lot going on beforehand. We, it was kind of crazy putting this whole thing together. And so I mentioned that I had some psilocybin and, it's, you know, three or four people raised their hand and said, yeah, yeah, let's do, you know, let's try some a little bit before that, you know, whatever. I think, you know, people were nervous. People, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, a little bit, not too much, you know, whatever. So I, I think four or five people participated. And then 
the party went really well and you could sort of just see even the people that were th there that weren't our you know from our team were like boy you know this is like a very well connected thing people you know it was such a good vibe in the room you could feel it and so the next day everyone came up to me and said you know that was the perfect thing for this event i felt really good i felt very personal and connected to everybody in the room it wasn't too much i was totally under control nobody knew you know whatever and i was thinking that's interesting you know like we go to cocktail parties first thing everybody does is get in line at the bar to get a cocktail right but we all know that after three or four cocktails things change and you're you know you're not as on your game right mm -hmm. but this is different <laughs> you know this actually enhances your game and as yeah. long as you know the right level and the right setting to be on i think it could be you know a performance enhancer in terms of a networking thing yeah the, the, so as long as you know the right level and the right setting you know those were yeah. key, key kind of to what you said and i wanted to you know make sure people heard this this was actually a business event this was yeah a, yeah. yeah you've <laughs> called it a party but it was a networking oh, yeah. event at a trade show yeah. and it was and so it was it wasn't a recreational party everybody's having a good time you had a you had a clear kind of intention for building a certain you know generating a certain atmosphere connecting with people in a certain way and um the the setting was right the intention was really clear right you were all um you know clear about kind of being in it together and what you wanted to get out of it and and it proved to be you know just uniformly positive for everybody yeah it was great and and the other thing about it too and i want to kind of tie it into other spirituality stuff too is that um these folks happen to be you know uh spiritual meditators mm -hmm. um they're into mindfulness like we had already talked about some of that stuff too mm -hmm. and so i felt like they were like a, a good they were a good candidates to try this on yeah. it didn't start out like a controlled experiment but it became one yeah. And the next day, you know, we, we kind of talked and we we were closer as a team. It brought us closer together as well, which is another thing. You know, we, not only did we make connections with new people, but we also felt like we bonded a little bit more. Yeah. You know, so I think that I, have you ever and, you know, have you thought about that with some of your groups, um, you know, and your, your get togethers about bringing more of this into the mix? Well, so not not in my Zen group. You know, um, it's actually, you know, frankly, it's just not needed in, right. in in the Sangha, you know, with the intentionality of our meditation practice. It can be helpful to open some windows and doors, but there's, you know, there's a risk in a meditative setting that, that you might become reliant on, yeah. uh, you know, say even a microdose to have a strong daily meditation practice. So I, I don't recommend doing that for that reason. Okay. Um, so if you're talking about a business or a coaching context, um, so I, I haven't introduced it to any, you know, gatherings, um, in my, in my work, I do see that where it could be helpful, you know, to do that, particularly if the intention is to, um, open up in certain ways and connect with people, you know, in, in certain ways. Um, yeah, and I think so. What what I find really interesting about the work that we we do together and my my mindfulness practice is that I've been getting better and better at um, sort of unifying my brain, controlling my thoughts better, uh, opening up my mind to different levels of consciousness. This is all I'm talking about meditation right now, but I also could be talking about psychedelics. So this is why I think they work really well together, and. I've gotten, you know, I feel like, and I've said this before on the podcast, so like, but the, the more you practice, the more benefit you get and the, the quicker it happens, right? So when you're thinking about the eightfold path and you now, and you have it memorized, then you can go to one of those things quicker in your head, right? When something comes up, you know, right now I'm suffering because I'm angry. Okay. How do I turn that anger around and take a deep breath and so on? So I find that's very powerful. The same thing happens with psychedelics, where my levels of consciousness go to a higher level, not just while I'm on it that day, but even it has a lasting effect. And mm -hmm. this is why I think microdosing is so popular is that, you know, you start out the first week or two, you're not so sure what's going on. But once you take them consistently for a while, there's a cumulative effect. 
you know, and I, I'd love I, you talked the other day about something. I want to ask you in a sec about that. But I think there's this clear connection between what happens in your brain when you are more mindful and you meditate more. And when you also do the psychedelics, I mean, I, I love to hike at the park here. I'll take it, you know, some mushrooms and I'll go out and walk for 10 miles. And I'm feeling super connected to my thoughts, to those trees over there, to that deer over there. And I come back and, you know, I'm, I'm really glowing in a way mentally, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of my uh, coaching clients, uh, former coaching clients who has a long career in, in pharma, you know, is really fascinated with this. And he, and he sent me uh, an article recently showing brain mappings of people with, you know, meditation, those who are meditating and those on strong, I think it was psilocybin and they, they look very similar, you know, the kind of, uh, channeling channels that are open and the activity in the regions of the brain, you know, are, are very similarly mapped. So it's, it, it's about capacity opening, right? The, the serotonin receptors are being activated that are not typically activated on the default mode network. You know, you can find all of this neurological studies out there on the web now. And it's, it's about capacity building, you know, this, this metaphor of opening windows and opening doors is, is very apt. Um, to increase connections and increase receptivity. It's not about feeling better for the sake of feeling better. I mean, you know, you've got alcohol and cocaine for that, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not about that. In fact, yeah. it's about increasing capacity and within the capacity is where the, the, um, the better feeling actually comes from. It comes from having higher capacity, not from having not having adverse things going through. So you you had talked, we were talking about this earlier. It's like you you're able to see see your anxiety in a sense from a from a, a, a outside perspective instead of being absorbed, say within an anxious state. Let's just call yeah. that the adverse state you're in. Now you're not you're not necessarily suppressing the anxious state. You're actually increasing the capacity with which you're experiencing the adverse state. And that that allows the adverse state to be processed through your body and your mind successfully. That's where the good feeling is coming from. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. And I think we're learning so much more about how it works. That's why it's pr very promising now that there's a lot more articles. There's also a lot of business opportunities. Uh, there's, you know, it's an emerging industry just like any other. And there's, there's a lot of companies that are raising capital. And there's a lot of, I believe, game changer things. So I, I'm involved with a company that's doing low dose, non-psychoactive psilocybin along with another molecule. And it's treating severe depression, PTSD, uh, you know, et cetera, CTE, things like that. And they're basically going after Xanax and Lexapro and, you know, all those uh, antidepressants. That's a billion dollar market. And it's so overprescribed. We all know it's overprescribed. What if you go to your doctor and he says, here, take this psilocybin pill instead of this Lexapro. And mm -hmm. it's going to be safer, non-addictive and work better. Right. So I think we ha all have to understand that the government was lying to us <laughs> for a long time about this stuff or just didn't know. And there is a lot of promise here, but you have to be careful about it. And I think the more that we get the clinical data in, the more there's going to be amazing news stories. I mean, our government is, is coming close to legalizing MDMA now nationally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ketamine is already very widely prescribed and, get, and being wonderful for some people. So we are slowly but surely getting to a day when this stuff is widely accepted, mm -hmm. um, but we're not there yet. Yeah, here's here's hoping that's the case. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't have a, a dog in the race other than I want people to have access to um, a valuable medicine. You know, and, and, and I certainly don't want, you know, corporate interests and commercial interests to privatize those or um, restrict access to those. And uh, that that, you know, there may, may may be and have been kind of forces going in that direction. But I agree with you. I think I think the wave is very much in order to, you know, have this come out and, and be used. My, my wife said something last night that was really interesting because we were we we were looking into this study of I think it was it was psych, psychedelics for OCD. Um, I have a, a close friend who is suffering from that and um, is interested in the potential for psychedelics. And sure enough, there's a ton of studies out there 
um, for psychedelics for OCD and um, all positive, all like really good. And, and the way they do, they phrase these studies now is, is, is it's for treatment resistant, OCD treatment resistant mm. uh, depression. And, you know, I kind of said to her, it's like, oh yeah, they, they do is treatment resistant. She's like, yeah, they just have to say that. So the pharmaceutical <laughs> companies aren't, right. aren't threatened. <laughs> right. But I, you know, so I was like, okay, well, if the Prozac doesn't work, then you go to this. Well, it also works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for non-treatment resistant, you could say, you know, yeah. um, symptomologies and, um, it does, you know, it does. And hopefully, you know, it will, um, be available, you know, we all know that the pharma industry has other motives, <laughs> let's yeah. face it. Right. Yeah. And I, I hope that the pharma and it's starting to happen where they embrace it and they say, you know what, you know, this is a good, this is better for our patients. You know, this is a better outcomes. It's safer. You know, that's the other thing about this stuff. It's almost always not. I shouldn't say almost always. I, in many cases, it's very safe. If you're in a good, safe environment, um, no one ever overdoses on mushrooms ever. No one's ever right. done it. LSD. Mm -hmm. It's safer for you than alcohol and cocaine for sure. And right. so, you know, but yeah, it's not for everybody. I want to keep keep saying that. But the more that we kn learn about it, the more we understand the implications. And believe me, pharma is threatened by it. You know, those blockbuster drugs that they make fortunes on, you know, that th this is a threat to them. But what's yeah. actually better for, for you personally or your society? society? I, I want to recommend another program because I love research. Uh, this show called Fantastic Fungi, which is a documentary. Paul Stamets, who many people know is a mushroom you know, guru. And um, it, it talks about the mushroom just in, in, the, in the society and also the ecology and the ground and the trees. And it's fascinating. I learned an awful lot about it. So I do encourage you know, everyone to do their own research and find out what, what's out there. But for me, almost everything, almost everything is very positive. Like there's, so, it's so exciting and I can't wait to see where we go in five and 10 years now that we are finally allowing the research to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's really great. It's great. We're at the, we're at the beginning, <clears throat> beginning of this second wave of the, of the Renaissance. And I think we're at the beginning of our, of our conversation with it too, Scott, I think we'll revisit this in more detail or in different areas, you know, in, in future podcasts. Um, I think that the, the thing that I want to, you know, help people with is to understand the, the, their intentions, you know, why, why are they, why are you ex exploring this? Um, if you if you are exploring why, why why is this of interest to you and i think this framework of the waking up growing up and stepping up is is a good one to to put your intentions frame your intentions right are you interested in in spiritual you know consciousness raising awesome are you interested in kind of therapy healing mental health kind of approach fantastic you know there are, there are forms and institutions and protocols for that um, and then are you interested in it for more of like a life enhancement kind of modality? Understand what you want. And then there are, you know, there are people, there are guides, there's forms and there's protocols for each of in each of these three domains. Um, yeah, I think that it also goes in a, in a uh, trajectory. And when I think about my own experience and um, I think that, you know, when I first started it, it was a growing up thing. Like I'm like, OK, I can handle this. This is interesting. What, what is it doing for me? Uh, then I started like fixing certain things, started clearing up in my head about maybe past issues or traumatic things, whatever. And I started waking up and started being, you know, doors and windows were open. And then I sort of shifted to maybe I could this this is a performance thing, maybe, you know, like maybe this will mm -hmm. help me, you know, uh, organize my thoughts about work. So like that was a progression that I noticed. And I, I now like I don't know if I would be called a psychonaut or whatever, but I'm a I'm a firm believer that this helps me in different ways. And it was a slow process. You know, I, I start small with slow, do, you know, low doses, work your way up and see how you perform in your daily activities and mm -hmm. see how it works for you. And then, you know, if it works well, slightly increase it and try it in different situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the kind of the protocols for microdosing or, or of that. And then if you are, um, interested in a macro dose, you know, a big experience with one of these, then, you know, find the qualified guide and 
you know, it's, it's probably worth saying that there's, there's a lot of people representing themselves as guys out there now who are not well-trained or, or not cleaned up with themselves and are bringing, um, you know, maybe not in integrity with what they're doing. So really vet, you know, the, the people who are, you're being called to, uh, to work with, work with somebody who is experienced and, um, I was, was, you, you, for a macro dose, you know, you, you also want to have a clear intention about, you know, like a big psychonautic experience, kind of like, you know, you said, are you a psychonaut? The, the psychonauts t typically want a big experience, a real kind of blowout experience um, in some way. And it might, you might not know exactly what you're getting, but you want to be open to, you know, a big, a big new experience around your, around your sense of yourself. And, you want to be and work with someone who's very intentional about getting you prepared for the experience and then also does a really good job of helping you integrate from the experience. And that means in the hours after the experience and then also in the days and weeks after the experience. OK, so the whole process um, should be very mindfully done for people who are doing a macro dose for the first time. You might consider, um, and, and a good guide will help you with this, doing a smaller macro dose for one retreat night or day, mm -hmm. and then a few weeks later doing a bigger one and escalating up yeah. um, to a bigger dose. So there's some really, really good best practices that are evolving around helping people with a a macro dose retreat experience that happens over a period of weeks that can be very life changing. I think the uh, post game, you know, working on yourself afterwards is super important to talk to somebody about what were your experiences like, what you learned from it. You know, was it what was anything bad? You know, sometimes it could bring up bad memories, you know, but I think the more that you integrate that conversation with it and and certainly I like to go out and have a good time right and, and i go to you know off to a music festival but i also like the next day next morning i'm sitting around with my best friends and we, we'll get into a deep conversation about something mm -hmm. and and you know it'll it, it might not be about the music or the partying or whatever it might be about life or our children or whatever so i think that there's there's after effects that are is worth recognizing yourself and your environment what changed as a result of your experience it, it, it's essential, you know, that kind of integration process, because w when you have a macro dose, you basically your para your paradigm gets rocked, totally rocked mm -hmm. your paradigm of what it means to be a self, a person. You could say your paradigm of reality. OK, your whole your whole sense of reality gets totally rocked. Now you start to re-enter into our normative, your normative paradigm. And that's that's your way of functioning in the world is according to the old paradigm. You can't live in this new paradigm. You you actually have to live with in the world that you've been living in, right? Because the inertial forces of your own mind are going to reaccumulate yeah. um, in your experience. It's going to come back. But there's that period where you are entering back in, and this that's the period where you can actually make connections between and open up the possibility of your old paradigm expanding to include yeah. your new paradigm. So that's the that's the most important part right there. That's fantastic. I love that. And, you know, we, we have a lot more to say about this and we're going to definitely have future episodes. Uh, maybe we'll get more specific about some of the, the molecules and, you know, the compounds. And um, hopefully we'll get a guest or two on to talk more about this. Um, I wanted to kind of finish up with one thought about the connection between it and Buddhism and all this. And I was thinking about, you know, the Buddha spent, you know, a lot of time, you know, uh, contemplating and, and, and meditating in, in caves. And, you know, then he finally came out and sat under the tree and, you know, he, you know, he said he was going to sit there until he was fully enlightened and all sorts of visions and demons were coming at him. And he, you know, he, his mind was so strong and he got to a certain point where, he was able to just reach this level of enlightenment, you know, that he had worked so hard for. And, and then he went and taught millions of people how to do it. And I was thinking about that. What well, you said to me earlier about opening your mind up to a different level of consciousness. That's kind of what the Buddha did back then, mm -hmm. you know, a long time ago. And he came up with the eightfold path and everything like that. And to me, I want to get there. I want to I want to learn all about that. And I feel like the, the psychedelics helped me 
along that path in some way. I'm still figuring it out, but I, I do feel this strong connection there. Yeah, there is a strong connection there. And there's there's some, you know, uh, there's differences between the paths, which are important to kind of, you yeah. know, point out, right? Um, so his his path was one of deep introspection. There were, there were no um, additional substances. There were no yeah. crutches. It was complete acceptance yeah. of his being. Right. So it was expansion, but it, there was no avoidance. There was no pushing anything away. Yeah. There was no escape. <laughs> there was no, you know, transcendence in the sense of getting away from something and bypassing his own humanity. Yeah. Because in fact, a lot back in the Buddha's day, there actually were a lot of people who were doing deep meditation and you and they would enter into these bliss states and they would say, oh, well, this is the highest truth. But but they were just totally spiritually bypassing, you know, they were bypassing their own humanity, you could yeah. say. The 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 thing about Buddhism, in fact, what he founded was this for this path of um, expanded consciousness and meditation, which actually included our humanity. Yeah. Right. So 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 it included that. And that's why the the part of psychedelics that are consistent with that practice. Are, are the part of the expanding the consciousness yeah. and really connecting with these deep levels of our self and our mind and our world and our feelings that are um, closed to us for whatever reason, you know, habit, mind mostly. Um, so to connect with those, but if there's any sense of escape or avoidance yeah. that is, you know, baked into the baked into the intention for the experience, um, you know, that's, that's going to go, you know, that's going to introduce a little counter force yeah. to what the Buddha was all about. I'll say that now, ultimately, you know, all of these are going to get blown away in your life and you're going to have to let go of everything. Yeah. That's how life works. You're ultimately, uh, nothing remains. Um, and you can, you know, you can kind of nicely have your doors blown open with, with these substances, yeah. um, that can help you, you know, help you expand. I love it. Yep. Thank you, Paul. This was a fascinating conversation and um, we will be back soon with more on this topic. Uh, for now, like, thank you again for listening. Uh, we hope you subscribe and share our podcast wherever you listen. Uh, don't forget to check out the Zen at Work newsletter and contact Paul for some coaching. And um, well, thank you, Paul. We'll see you again soon. It's been fun, Scott. Okay, more to come. Thank you for joining us on this exploration into Zen Buddhism and its transformative influence on work and life. We hope you'll subscribe, share, and comment wherever you get your podcasts. May your journey be one of continuous growth and mindful living. From all of us here at Game of Zen, wishing you peace and prosperity on your path ahead.